Ronnie Kosher live stream. Hi folks, this is Matt at Pranakasha Productions, and today we have the great good fortune to have Muhammad Noor as our guest. And um, Muhammad is a professor at Duke University. And, That's right, um, right now. <laughs> and a consultant for Star Trek Discovery, a science consultant, which is, that's cool right off the bat. And then also you have your own YouTube channel, which is BioTrekkie Explains. And then also you are an expert on DNA and, and genetic sequencing and that kind of stuff, right? That's right. It's a pleasure. Right. Uh, thanks for having me on your show. <laughs> Love to have you. So it sounds like we got lots of stuff to talk about. Totally. So uh, let's just launch right in. So what's this on Discovery? How did you get that gig? <laughs> I beg. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, um, I was fortunate. So you mentioned that I work at Duke University uh, in, two, I think it was 2019. Gosh, all the years kind of blend together now. I can't remember if it was 2018 or 2019. One of those okay. years I was, at, uh, I was at Dragon Con and I was giving a okay. talk with uh, Dr. Aaron McDonald on science in Star Trek Discovery. By the way, I should mention uh, Dr. Aaron McDonald is actually the science advisor for the whole Star Trek franchise now. That wasn't true oh, really? when we were doing that talk, but she's the science advisor for that. I just do some contract work for like Discovery and things like okay. that. Okay, and wasn't she, um, you probably saw that that telethon thing they did yes. the other day? Yeah, yeah, the, the Trek Geeks uh, Hollywood Food Coalition fundraiser. Yeah, she yeah. was a moderator there talking to people I saw from her the European there. Space Agency. Yeah, yeah exactly. and I actually, I contributed 100 bucks to that. Oh, nice. So, I yeah. contributed too. <laughs> All right. Well, they raised, I heard they raised like $75,000. That's right. It was amazing. It's amazing. And their goal was like 15 or something <laughs> to start with. And it just kept they going They knocked higher it out of the park. Yeah. Well, they had so many guests, Star Trek yeah. guests. And um, yeah, it was, I didn't, to tell you the truth, I didn't watch the whole thing because it was like eight hours long. Yeah, or it was something. long. It was long. Yeah. It was hard but to I watch watched, it just in one go. Yeah. <laughs> I watched like at least an hour or two of it. Yeah. It was very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, Aaron and I have been friends, though, for, for years because we, we both would go to uh, conventions and talk about science and Star Trek. And she's an astrophysicist, so her training is very different from mine, whereas I'm a biologist. Okay. So, you know, we, we said, hey, let's partner up and talk about science and Star Trek Discovery. So we did that. And some interesting people came to that talk. Uh, um, Mary Chifo, who plays Laurel in Discovery, and yeah. Ken Mitchell, who plays Cole at the time, and um, Jane Brooke, who plays Admiral Katrina Corwell. So they all came and actually sat in the back. Uh, Mary was actually friends with Aaron. So I think that's what brought them to the talk. Okay. But, you know, they wanted to see this like, oh, let's check this out. And I mean, it was funny at the end, Ken raised his hand and asked a question. To everybody, whoa, and turned around. <laughs> that's okay. cool. Yeah. But after that, Jane came up to me, <clears throat> Jane Brooke came up to me and said, hey, I went to Duke University. <laughs> you know, And I was like, really? And at the time, I was just about to teach a course the next semester on uh, genetics and evolution using Star Trek. So actually I have a book here, actually right here, it's called Live Long and Evolve, what Star Trek can teach us about genetics, uh, evolution and life on other worlds. Oh, great. Okay, well, put, using... can you get that on Amazon? You can, absolutely. Okay, so we'll put a link in the description for that. Sure, Yeah, <laughs> that'd be great, thank you. Yeah, anyway, sure. I, I was teaching a class using this. It basically is my introductory genetics and evolution class as part of the majors, uh, part of the biology major here, but okay. I thought I'll do it as a non-major version, but I'll using Star Trek. So I thought that'd be fun. So I asked Jane, like, could you come as a guest? Because that would be fantastic for the students when we're talking about like genetics evolution and, and having the Star Trek angle to have somebody associated with Star Trek show up. And she was very gracious. So yeah, I'd, I'd love to. It's my alma mater. I want to come back and see it. So cool. she came and, you know, we had a blast. And she actually, I'd given her a copy of the book at that convention. And she's, she actually started as a science major. I think she was interested in environmental science when she started in, in college, but then of course went to theater, not surprisingly, given where she ended up, okay. but she had annotated the books like throughout all sorts of comments and things like that. And she came and she asked all these questions, really, really, really good questions. It, it kind of blew my mind just how inquisitive and awesome she was. Nice. So I mentioned to her at the time, like, you know, I, I would love to consult for Star Trek Discovery. And I, at the time I had tweeted a couple of times to him saying, hey, are you interested? But I didn't even know who to tweet to. I didn't, I didn't know right. who was involved in what way. I, I wasn't associated with the franchise except just as a huge fan. Okay. She said, she said, well, you know, I know one of the writers. Let me, let me talk to them. So she sent me up to talk to one of the writers. The writer had me talk to the showrunner. One thing led to another and boom. What was great is like at that same time, Dr. Erin McDonald, who I mentioned earlier, she was actually going through the process. I didn't even know this was happening. She was going through the process of interviewing to be the science advisor for the franchise. So cool. in, the, 
yeah, so for season three, we ended up getting to work together, which was funny because we already knew each other too. So they said, oh, we have an astrophysicist and we have a project we want you guys to work on together. Her name is Dr. Erin McDonald. I, like, I know her. Okay. I know her really well. <laughs> it's not like I know so many astrophysicists either. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to throw one in there. There Now, this isn't even... So I'm assuming your consultants would, would be more like the life sciences type of Correct. stuff? Correct. Okay. So this isn't really a question for you, but I'm going to throw it at you anyways. Please. So what's the deal with this giant black hole thing that's like five light years <laughs> wide? I mean, there isn't such a thing even that huge in the known the universe. Dark, it's talking about the dark matter anomaly. So that's season yeah. four. Well, A, I don't have anything to do with the physics side. And B, uh, any non-disclosures I have always include the current season. And that season is airing right now. So even if I did know something, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> I know nothing. nothing. I know nothing. Exactly. Good Hogan's Heroes reference. Sol I love it. <laughs> Sergeant Schultz. Sergeant Schultz. Okay, we'll let that go then. So what we did what we did work on together, though, was the... Um, uh, Sukal scream and the and the burn in season three. So we worked on that together because that had yeah. elements of physics there in terms of like why did the scream you know affect dilithium throughout the uh, throughout the galaxy and things like that, okay. as well as like how did this in some way associate with this one person's biology? So okay. we actually worked on something for that. Obviously, it's fictional, so I mean, like we had right. to stretch things to make it work. But we came up with something that like is not crazy. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Wow. Now, the, I should say the writers had already come up with the idea that it was associated. Like, we didn't make up the idea that it was going to be a scream. They told us there was going to be this person, he's a Kelpie, and he's going to scream that that lithium is going to go away. Now, science that to make it work. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, that's the thing that makes, well, of course, you know, Star Trek. I mean, once you come up with anything like that, the fans are going to, like, think through it yes. as if it's real. Like, you know, yes. how we get in arguments about how warp engines work and stuff yes. and what dilithium is actually supposed to do. Yeah. You know, and like how many, what's the proper yield of photon torpedoes? Yeah. And so on and off so forth. You know, we get into it. And, it's if, and if something, it's funny because if something falls apart, we get upset. Yes. But then, of course, you go back. If you go back and watch the shows, you realize, well, there's a different writer for each episode. Yeah. And there's a lot of continuity things that don't quite line up. No, of course. Of course. The other thing to yeah. it too is they don't they do give you some science behind it all, but they, they don't give like an hour long seminar explaining every link, you know, going from point A to point Z. Like they, they have to just have a couple of quick lines of text. Right. So what we did is we had we gave them a couple of quick lines of text, but we also right. wrote an article for Star Trek.com that basically okay. laid it out in a little bit more depth. In there case somebody really wants to know like, okay, how on earth would blah blah blah, blah happen again? Well, it's still duh, all you have to do is reverse <laughs> the polarity of the DNA <laughs> of the DNA uh, strings, and then it'll work. There you go. Narrow the <laughs> confinement beam is nothing they always do in Star Trek. We need to narrow yeah, the confinement and then, beam yeah, further. Reverse, reverse the polarity, then hit it with a tachyon beam, and we're good. Perfect. Right? I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh boy. All right. So, well, so you and I have, have have chatted a bit on Facebook and I was picking your brain a little. Yeah. And I was and I was trying to get you into that whole deal about what's um, phosphorus in our DNA. And maybe that's maybe that indicates yeah, that life really came from Mars. And then you yeah. said, I'm not a biochemist. I don't know that. Yeah, no. <laughs> so, so what so maybe maybe I could have you tell us the difference between someone who's a biologist and someone who's a biochemist sure, and then well, someone who knows all about dna and um, sure, i can tell you let me let me tell that. you what i do and then what okay. i know <laughs> so I'm, I'm primarily an evolutionary biologist right and okay. i'm very interested in, in specifically the genetic changes that underlie evolution like okay. why is it that we are not you know, chimpanzees or even Neanderthal or, you know, you know okay. fairly similar related species. Now, I don't do that using humans. I, my research actually uses fruit flies. When there's a whole bunch, I mean, you, when you think about fruit flies, you just think fruit fly, but there's like thousands of fruit fly species, even within the genus, you may have heard of Drosophila, even within the genus right. Drosophila, there's over a thousand species of it. Some of them right. actually can make hybrids, just kind of like, you know, like Vulcan and human. <laughs> Some of them can make hybrids. Often the hybrid, yeah. specifically the hybrid males, but often the hybrids in general are sterile. So okay. one of the things I'm interested in is like, what, why is it that hybrids are sterile? Like, what is it about having this set of genes with that set of genes that makes them get messed up? 
And why is it you know, predominantly the males is one of the questions that had been researched for a long time. That's a, that's a very common pattern. It's interesting, actually, when I, was, when I was researching for my book, I looked over all the different uh, Star Trek hybrids out there, and there's an overabundance of female first-generation hybrids. <laughs> so I was like, hey, that's consistent. I, I'm sure it's just random, but it, but it was it was interesting because that is consistent with the, the pattern Reality. you see actually in nature. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, two things right there. Sure, please. So number one, I think the reason why you use fruit flies is big for one thing the lifespan so short that exactly there's a good turnaround so it's great for exactly two weeks experimenting, yep. right two weeks so that and then the okay and number two so are you implying that spock would not be able to have children <laughs> it's highly probable <laughs> now we know in the case of i'm trying to remember with vulcans do we ever know of a second generation after a after a like spock didn't have kids i'm trying to think of other f1s uh, what was his name? Lorian from Enterprise. He was he was uh-huh. uh, Trip and Tapal's kid. He didn't have any kids. It's it's. I'll say it's likely. <laughs> hmm. So if when we're in that, people hybrids are more likely to have for lobster. And we see that you know, for example, with um, Kalar from uh, Next Generation. Uh, Worf and Kalar had uh, Alexander. Or wait, no, sorry, she's an F one. So she, uh, she's already a hybrid of a human and Klingon. And then Worf and her had Alexander. So she was clearly fertile. Okay. So here's yeah. another follow-up question. Sure. So when that's the case, when the male is sterile, is it is like their DNA is so hopelessly messed up that they won't be able to kids? Or could you just prepare a few things in there and then they'd be able to have that's kids? That's a wonderful question. That's a wonderful question. So it's not so much that their DNA is messed up, but you, what often happens is there's some sort of bad interaction between one genome and the other genome. So let's say, for example, there's a protein that's being produced from this genome that interacts poorly with the protein from there or interacts poorly with DNA from there, something like that. Could you edit it out and fix pieces to it? I, I would say it's not impossible. I would say it's okay. not impossible. Now, often things like hybrid sterility tend to be very genetically complex. It's not usually just like this one protein with this one protein and boom, that fixes it all. That's very rare. It tends to be much more complex. It's more it's like, complicated. Oh, yeah. Okay. But kind of like maybe, that's, maybe that's in the case of Klingons, it's less so. I mean, but- I think that's like the same reason why you can't cure the common cold or you can't cure cancer because the two things are actually ex- extremely complicated. You yeah. Know, they have well, a, a name, overarching name. That's the problem. Dive like, into it. There's yeah. a whole lot to it. Exactly. Cancer is like, yeah. like headache. I mean, there's like, there's so many different things that can cause. I mean, cancer is just like abnormal cell growth, I think. Okay. It's not, it's not like it's one symptom. I mean, what we see is we see as abnormal cell growth, but like a million things could cause that. Right. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. Interesting. So cold is a little bit more focused because when we say cold, we're talking about infection with specific virus and things like that, but still, it's still a little dodgy. <laughs> yeah. But supposedly, well, at least in Kirk, Spock and McCoy's timeline, they hadn't, they haven't cured the common cold yet. Yeah. <laughs> they also were kind of behind on Neuralink, so they couldn't even, you know, with um, Pike, they couldn't clue into his brain and restore his mortar you know all his oh yeah damage yeah, yeah. from all the from the delta rays yeah but they seem like but, they did a very poor job that all they could do is just do the little like one light versus one two light. lights <laughs> yeah like it we seems... can do better than that now yeah <laughs> let me tell you <laughs> yeah I think they didn't try very hard on poor bike <laughs> yeah or there was a well, lot of damage i guess it's as a, actually yeah, well damage. actually you might be able to come up with a reason why like you could say like his his dna was so horribly mangled by the delta rays that you know there was just no hope yeah it uh, probably wouldn't be dna it would probably be actually his brain i mean as opposed right. to anything about his dna per se but yeah i guess i guess so that still seems it seems unlikely just in the sense that since he can't he does he did seem like he's still capable of complex thought it didn't right. seem like it, you know so maybe i don't know i'm not a neurobiologist by any means again i'm genetics and evolution side right. so. <laughs> but i guess of I, course in, dang if only they would have kept one of his pattern buffer you know when he's a transporter they could have just you know retransported a better version of him back in there and or just made a or made a bunch of clone clone pikes <laughs> I yeah. still don't really get why that doesn't happen, but whatever. I'll just leave that alone. <laughs> well, they they did have those clone. Well, they cloned Riker in that one yeah. PNG episode. Yeah, yeah. There's and, so many. And there's always that philosophical question of whether it's actually the same person on the other side, or are you dead and that's just the clone? <laughs> uh, okay. Well, if you want to go there, <laughs> then you get into the whole thing about what is consciousness and awareness. Yeah. And all that. Yeah. Like, for example, okay, we went there. 
So like there's this <laughs> thing there. right now, there's this whole thing about artificial intelligence, right? And like the computers are going to take over and humankind is going to go extinct because mm-hmm. they're just going to surpass us. But I personally don't believe that because we call it artificial intelligence, but I think the better term for it is imitation intelligence. Mm. This is why I say that. Mm -hmm. It's because no matter how complex the computer can perform little logical operations, all it is is like a bunch of dominoes falling down in certain patterns, but there's no awareness to it. Mm-hmm. Like the computer does not have an actual awareness of what's going on. And all mm-hmm. the things that it does mean nothing to it, right? Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. only useful to humans because we're actually aware. We have this thing mm-hmm. called consciousness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I know that a big argument is, well, like all it has to do is become complex enough. And then magically, suddenly it will have consciousness. Mm-hmm. Well, I completely don't buy that. <laughs> so, partly because i've done a lot of meditation in my life mm-hmm. and i've thought about this a lot but i don't personally ob- and i'm not going to even say i don't believe i yeah. say i do not observe that awareness the actual awareness the actual consciousness is a function of the complexity of the thoughts that fly through my mind hmm. okay okay so let me ask you. Let me ask you some questions. Y'all turn it around. Okay. Well, let's start, let's start simple. Okay. A fly, fruit okay. fly or whatever. Is it aware? I um, mean, it certainly reacts to things. It reacts to things in, in different I think, ways. Well, it's, it's, I would say yes, actually. Okay. So I would say that actually, a flu, a fruit fly has experiences, mm-hmm. and actually, I would say yes is aware because I would see in my belief Mm -hmm. or and also my observation that any living thing has awareness okay okay so like i would even say that on some level a fruit flyer has desires Mm -hmm. and actually i would say even though the biologists tell you that they don't i would say that they do they they do i mean they they clearly (laughs) but i remember in my biology class when we took flies or moths or whatever, and mm-hmm. we impaled them with these giant spikes, mm-hmm. which are basically push pins, but to them, mm-hmm. it was this giant telephone. Of course, yeah. Them, right? yeah. They're like, don't worry, they're lower life forms and they don't feel pain or anything. And then we were like, yeah. okay, fine, we can do That's this. That's solidly not true, but okay. <laughs> I do not believe that. <laughs> That's solidly not true. <laughs> I believe that they do feel pain. Yeah, yeah, In fact, yeah. I think like a worm, the whole thing, yeah. That, but we know worms feel pain. We see this all the time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's like when they're when a worm is like outside of the ground and in the sun. Yeah. It tries hard. It it's like, I gotta get out of here. Yeah. And yep. I would say, yep. yes, that's because it's feeling pain. It's feeling a burning sensation yeah. on its skin. And it's like, this isn't good. I gotta get yeah, away. Yeah. So the argument, what I tell my son all the time when we're out looking at because he'll say things about like, was this fly thinking about this? Is this fly thinking about that? Now, is he, my son, I should mention, is uh, intending to go into computer science. So this is a great right. conversation involving Oh, him. good. I say that like, you, if you think about the fly, it's just like, it's just a, a, its brain is basically not that different from a computer program. There's mm-hmm. a lot of if thens, like if this, then that, if see female go around to the side and try to mate, if smell this food, you know, divert your attention to it. There's a lot of things, right? Like that. A lot of these sort of if thens. Mm-hmm. But I think the technical, well, it's a dated now, but the old technical term for this was fixed action patterns. That like, you know, when receive X stimulus, go through this pre preset set of behaviors that, that's yeah. a slightly dated term now that too but the thing is i mean computer human beings do the exact same thing it's just that's, like I that's where i was gonna go it's like so, I'm, I'm less convinced that we are different right <laughs> i just well, think we have I, I say we're a much longer computer program than the fruit flies computer program. Yeah. they have a fairly short program. you could probably write most of it right <laughs> whereas our program well, is very well, long here's my point though my point is yes we have all this like a, and my my brain works on stimulus and response yeah. and then it, it goes through constant patterns it's constantly yeah. turning and also the, the, the other big difference between a human and a computer is that inside a human brain there's this constant churning of background noise and random thoughts and stuff that go on where a computer is most well nowadays who knows with windows but <laughs> what it used <laughs> to be point. is that there was a definite purpose for every single 
yeah. function, right? Yeah. And um, with multi-threading and everything, it gets a lot more complicated now, but there, yeah. you didn't used to have to deal with that. See, I know a little bit about this because I used to be a Java programmer. Oh, nice. So, and so I do have some experience with this stuff. Anyways, yeah, yeah. but my point is, again, yes, our awareness and our consciousness is guided by our thoughts and by the neurons of our brain. And we there's all these patterns that we experience, right? But my point is all that's happening. And sometimes we feel completely bound to those things, mm -hmm. but actually your awareness is not that. Your awareness is the awareness that observes and experiences all that. Mm -hmm. And is able to step back and look at it mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. differentiate itself from it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so what my point is that unless they can figure out a way to somehow magically get this thing yeah. called awareness to inhabit a robot or an AI. Mm -hmm. Now, if that happened, then we'd be in trouble. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But if they can't figure out how to do that, then all it is is a basically... It's a machine pretending to be like an aware, conscious being, but it's it's only a machine. It's an empty shell, and there's nothing inside it that actually is aware. So yeah, uh, that's my I, take on that. And I, I mean, yeah. I know you can argue to the cows come home again. Some people <laughs> buy that. I feel like that, sometimes we think we're more aware than we are, or we think of intentionality more than than is actually true. Like, well, well I'll say like, I'm intentionality hungry, I'm is not really awareness. Okay. Okay. Aware, what I'm saying, when I say awareness, I mean the actual awareness. Okay. So, um, like, like I'm sitting here mm -hmm. and I'm hungry. I'm aware that I'm hungry, right? Yeah. That's different than a computer program scanning itself and coming up with an algorithm yeah. that indicates, oh, the, the, the sugar levels in the bloodstream are low yeah. or whatever yeah. and we need to now put some food in the mouth mm -hmm. that's different than me feeling oh i'm hungry you yeah know, mm, dang it i really feel hungry i got off some food see i feel like that i feel like the, what you're describing i mean and i'm just playing devil's advocate here i feel <laughs> like what you're describing here is a, as a product of evol the product of evolution over a long time in the sense mm -hmm. that what would happen is you know some things would have would would be low on sugar and you know a subset of it i'm just making up these fictional ancient sure, okay. animals right <laughs> some fictional ancient animals then like you know they released some hormone which then you know made you know the the smell of sugar or smell of sweet things much much sweeter mm -hmm. others didn't do that and the ones that did that then had more kids so therefore that that right. program spread so like are, you know is is that awareness something that just comes about from natural selection in that sense well again see this is the thing <laughs> I guess I just have to keep saying this point. Um, all those habit patterns, yes, all did come from natural selection, right? Mm -hmm. But not the actual awareness of the experience. Not the, uh, let me put it another way. Awareness being the experience of you as an aware being living within your own mind, living within your own body. I see. So you're more, th you're more than con aware. contemplative. Yeah. contemplative of it i see so are dogs aware then i mean like you know because dogs will I, like dogs yes. will eat till they're not hungry or when they're not when they don't need food like they'll eat to the point that they'll throw up so are they, right. are they lacking that awareness um well then, then you get into this whole philosophical thing well how do you even know whether your neighbor is aware like how do i know that you're aware that's true yeah, how do i know that you're not yeah. just <laughs> pretending to be a human and i'm actually the only aware person in the whole universe and everything true. else yeah. is an illusion right it's very cartesian <laughs> yeah. so you get into that yeah. and um i mean there's a lot of ways you can go mm -hmm. luckily a fascinating topic. um luckily some scientists are willing to talk about it now i mean it, it it's sort of taboo it seems to be in especially in um in education in the education world what am i trying to say um like religion and 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 science split mm -hmm. quite a while ago several centuries ago mm -hmm. and the two try to keep each other separate at least the two camps sometimes, sometimes like yeah. to keep themselves separate at least 
yeah. when they're talking in, in certain situations. Yeah. Even though there's lots of scientists that believe in God, lots of scientists yep. that have a religion, Absolutely. but they keep the two things separate. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but there are some scientists now that I observe on YouTube and the internet, physicists, especially, especially the ones that start talking about quantum mechanics and all the yeah. weird stuff that goes on down there. Yeah. That, yeah. There's a lot of stuff we don't know. Mm -hmm. And maybe we shouldn't categorically just discount the fact that maybe there is some kind of universal consciousness, mm -hmm. even though maybe we can't describe it or mm -hmm. can't even design an experiment that will prove or disprove it. But yet we're scientists, so we still need to be open minded enough to consider yeah. the possibility. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. No, fair enough. Yeah. So, um, and then, I mean, if you go if you go far a little farther with it, you're like, well, there have I mean, there's you got to consider it, especially if it is this thing that actually exists. And like, okay, here's another one. I mean, just the fact that our universe even works at all. Don't even talk about life. Mm -hmm. You know, it's already a miracle that we have multicellular life on Earth and that it's yeah, evolved incredibly to unlikely. We we really got lucky. <laughs> yeah, like, well, for, here's the thing. Uh, okay, maybe I won't go to the other one. I mean, it's also incredibly unlikely that we would even live in a in a universe where atoms can exist and electrons, and then f molecules can interact, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then little particles of dust can attract themselves and then become planets and suns and all these mm -hmm. things, all these macro things that we take for granted. Mm -hmm. it's actually when you go down to the nuts and bolts of it it's a miracle that any of it works you know so one way to deal with that is well there's umpteen bajillion universes and we just happen to live in the one most super unlikely one that actually works you know that's one way to deal with it right possibility yeah another is there's this universal consciousness that actually put our universe together in a certain way that works Mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. that's another way to say to mm -hmm. deal with it you know um yeah, yeah. so okay so now i'm gonna go away from that back into biology sure so i also contemplated well how come we didn't get how come we don't live in a in a world where it just uh we ended up with like single-celled organisms that learned how to you know efficiently process the sun or whatever and then they're, they're like, okay, we're all good. So now we're just going to live in a planet full of algae for the next 12 billion years. Because oh, yeah. it, we did it. We don't need multicellular. We'll just be single celled and everything's good. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, a lot of things on Earth did that, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of things that are, that are on Earth that are uh, unicellular, single cell that, that have been, you know, their ancestors all the way back have been too. So, so what's the point a, of being multicellular? Lineages. You know, what's so great about it? I mean, I mean complex it things tend to fall apart, don't they? <laughs> Yeah, sometimes, but I mean, <laughs> what what helped promote multicellularity? It's not the only thing, but one of the things that helped promote it was this, you know, basically this endo endosymbiosis event, right? Where you know one, you know, single celled organism swallowed the smaller one, and it ended it ended up giving it power. It's, it's basically what's now our mitochondria, right? So that came that was essentially that was essentially a, a different organism that got swallowed, and it reproduced inside the original cell. And when that cell split, those little things which eventually became mitochondria split too. So it's essentially it's having this powerhouse built in. And it came from that. And that is one of the big things that helped multicellularity come about. So, okay. But if that hadn't happened, would, we, would, would there be multicellular organisms? I don't know. <laughs> there might not and be. Maybe it would it, be exactly the word you're describing. Didn't it take like a billion years for that to happen? Yeah. Yeah. A couple billion. Yeah. <laughs> it's a long time. That's what I always joke about when people talk about like looking for life in outer space. They're like, oh, let's look for a, uh, what's the thing called? The Dyson sphere. They're like, mm -hmm. okay, you're looking for like crazy complex things. I said, if we want to yep. look for life in outer space, we should be like dipping something into a liquid on Europa and stuff right. like that. That's where we're very likely to find it. Cause you know, thinking right. about life on earth, even today, like how much life on earth is, is single cell, like a ton of it. And for the first 2 billion years, all of it. So, okay. All right, yeah. let's go into panspermia then. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Star Trek, the early on in Star Trek, <laughs> they decided, you know what? We don't have the budget to have all these freaking weird looking um, aliens in our show. So we need to come up for a reason why whenever we go to a new planet, they pretty much look like humans with like a few, diff a few subtle differences. Yep. 
And so they came up with this idea of panspermia, or maybe they didn't come up with it. They adopted it. Yeah. No, they said, okay, created, what happened, of course. <laughs> what happened is many eons ago in the Four galaxy, billion years ago. Yeah. Or 3.5. Whatever they, I can't remember what they said. Yeah. Some humanoids basically went around and populated the whole galaxy, spread their DNA everywhere and just spread the seed. And, and they were all humanoid. And that's why everyone in the galaxy is basically a humanoid or most of the species that we run into on the show. So they figured that out. I, I remember reading that. And so now that uh, most likely that idea was already had already been around, right? Of course. Of okay. Course. It's very problematic too. the way, uh, not, not the idea itself, but the application in Star Trek. Okay. Be because what it's assuming, this is one of the most, the most, one of the most difficult parts. It's assuming that even though we share ancestors with, Klingons and I'm trying to think all the all the aliens that were on that planet. Klingons and Romulans and Cardassians, our, an, our shared and well, they weren't there. I'm, I'm trying to think who was on that planet specifically, just because it's, it's 100% them. Then in theory, Andorians could be some other offshoot or something. Like okay, that. but our shared ancestors four billion years ago. We are literally more closely related to grass <laughs> than we are <laughs> to all those other things. Like. We don't make hybrids with grass. <laughs> we don't look remotely similar to grass. Like that level of convergence, this idea of coming and, and looking that similar, like take us to a, to a, say like a Cardassian or Cardassian looks pretty similar to us. Romulans look very similar to us. Mm -hmm. We would look that similar 4 billion years later in complete isolation, like giving on different planets for the next 4 billion years astronomically unlikely because we think about all, what are all the random events like we just talked about endosymbiosis did that happen exactly four billion years ago on all those different planets okay. and what about like what knocked back the dinosaurs was there a, was there an asteroid impact on every one of those planets six, 65 million years ago i mean there's so many random events that that led to what we are today and, th and that kind of discounts all of them like well no, no, i have a solution like, for that oh please okay so these guardians of the universe yeah not only did they have warp drive, but of course they also could, they had time travel. They had the ability uh, to go forward and backward in time. So yeah. what they do is they systematically go forward and backwards in time and make sure that nothing Everything. gets too out of whack so that throughout the whole history of the galaxy, humanoids pretty much maintain Got it. pretty close Got to it. the form that they wanted them to be. It's kind of an act of God argument. Yeah. At that point, yeah. if, you, if you invoke an act of God argument, then you can explain anything. Yeah. Well, sure. Q, Absolutely. we have Q. We don't have yeah. God in Star Trek. Like <laughs> yeah. Star Trek is afraid, except for Deep Space Nine was the first show that actually embraced religion yeah. and not have it be some hokey thing com yeah, yeah. controlled by a computer behind the scenes. Right? <laughs> Landru. <laughs> right. But surprisingly, so there's no God in Star Trek, really. Except surprisingly, we have Q. Yeah. Which is awfully close to being, he's not God with the capital G, but he's yeah, yeah. obviously a, a, some kind of God, kind of like the Greek gods or something. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Someone with a lot of he's power. Extraordinarily powerful in a way that we cannot possibly understand it. Yeah. No, it's right. true. It's so true. we had him. So, so there is an interesting thing. I'm going to come back to the thing in terms of uh, the argument from the chase. There are actually two other episodes of Star Trek that try to explain why there's so many humans and the other two are from the original series yeah. so one one points out to one points out its own era that's in uh, return to tomorrow that's the one where they go down the planet there's those glowy balls mm -hmm. i don't know if you remember. yeah and they say something like you know uh 60 i forget that he said he said a specific number i can't remember what the number was it was something like you know 60 million or not 60 million or something much more recent than that like six hundred thousand years ago our ancestors were flying around the galaxy it's possible that your legends in adam and eve were two of our travelers yeah yeah now to their credit um diana moldar who was also in that episode this is before she was pulaski this is an original series right yeah, mm -hmm. but she made the comment heard. like, well, we we know that life on Earth evolved independently. And it's true. The flaw with that argument is it suggests that we're not related to everything else on Earth, that we're not related to chimpanzees and gorillas and, and trees and, and seagulls, and like that, which we know we are. I mean, we see the DNA evidence is incontrovertible. So that's the problem okay. with that one. And kudos to Star Trek for pointing it out. But there's a third one that actually works fine. And that's from, it's kind of a cringy episode. It's, uh, uh, I, forget the name of, I forget the name of it, Paradise Syndrome. It's the one where Kirk goes down the planet. There's all these Native Americans there, like, <laughs> oh yeah, Kirk, behold yeah. the god who bleeds. Exactly, that's the one. That's the yeah. one. So in that one, they, they had that. They had that big asteroid. Uh, the, oh, the obelisk thing. The yeah. Obelisk. Thank you. That's yeah. what I was looking for. They had the big obelisk, and 
when Spock translated it, it said something like this was this was placed by a super race known as the preservers, and they went to different plants and rescued cultures in danger of extinction. Huh? So that actually works fine because what you could say there is that rather than aliens came to Earth, you could say Earthlings went to these other worlds. And if you place it back, I mean, Native American thing is a little funny. But let's say you, let's say you did it back at the time, say Homo erectus. Mm-hmm. You know, so something like you know, a couple hundred thousand years ago, you place them on another planet. Could they end up having forehead ridges or something like that? So they mm-hmm. look a little bit more like a Klingon or like a, a Bajoran if it's just a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's doable. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, and there's, that's not violating any evolutionary principle. And we know that humans and Neanderthal and humans and Denisovan, we know that humans and other hominids had fertile offspring. Okay. So, right? I mean, that basically solves all of it, and that solves it much better than the chase or than the than the other episode that we're turned to tomorrow. So okay, that, that works fine. I'm, I'm of course, Star Trek is in the end based in reality, right? Yes, yes. So there were lots of people that believed in UFOs, yeah. and of course the chariots of the gods and that that whole movement came after star trek mm-hmm. at least it got really popular in the early 70s but now we got the history channel and we got and we i forgot what his name is darn it but the guy with the hair that everybody knows you know the grass tyson no 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 <laughs> i'm just got it already <laughs> neil degrasse tyson would be upset if you confounded him with the, with the guy i'm talking i'm talking to the history channel oh a history channel person. UFO Sorry, guy. Somebody good. you know oh with the hairspray. yeah yeah i know who you're talking about yeah i don't know that anyway yeah. <laughs> so we got those guys and then we also have i mean there's people that say well if you if you translate the bible correctly mm-hmm. you know if you go back to the ancient hebrew uh, or if you start looking at some of the other books of the Old Testament that are now known from the Dead Sea Scrolls, but didn't make it into the canon, there's lots of stuff in there that, like, for example, the word Elohim, which gets translated as God or the Lord God mm-hmm. in English, actually is a plural word, mm-hmm. which means the strong ones. Mm-hmm. So if you translate the book of Genesis, it doesn't say God created the heavens and the earth. It says the strong ones created. Interesting. Isn't that? Interesting. And then then, so there's people that say, well, actually, whenever it says Elohim, the strong ones, those are like the star people that you hear about in all these other traditions, like the Hopi Mm. tradition and all this. Mm. And so they're not, and that's why they act so weird. That's why God in the Old Testament is such a weird, mean dude that isn't loving and like he's and all caring and omniscient and like he's supposed to be in Christianity. But in the Old Testament, he's like, does all these weird things and and you can't trust him because he gets mad and then he tells you to go off and kill all these people and all this stuff. Well, some people say that's not God. That's the strong ones. And the reason why they're so weird is because they were a race of powerful beings that argued amongst themselves and had different factions and they disagreed. And some of them were nice to humanity and other ones just wanted humanity to be slaves. And it goes on and on and on and on. Like Sounds very much like the, the Roman gods a little bit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So anyways, I mean, there's people that say, well, that's actually where humans came from was all this stuff. Hmm. And then, the, you know, the whole thing where people say, well, humans are a hybrid, like we're a hybrid alien DNA plus, <sighs> plus, you know, apes. That's why. <laughs> We, we, we're kind of related to apes, but we look way different, you know, and so yeah. all that stuff. So let's let's go there. So can you? <laughs> I don't love this one, but go ahead. OK, here we go. <laughs> so can you absolutely refute that and say, no, I can tell you 100 percent. I've looked at the human DNA and there's no alien sequences in there. It's all I don't even know what alien planet sequences Earth. means. Like, what does alien sequence mean? It just means like sequence that doesn't match anything else we've seen. I mean. That, in that case, you could say like every single individual is an alien, <laughs> you know, well, an, an alien relative to each other too. I mean, the, the- I mean, okay. So there is this thing where some people say like, okay, there's one, there's a, there's a sci-fi trope that's like, you know, one day this alien DNA landed yeah. on the Earth from a meteor, and then yeah. it was so different from our DNA that it just took over the entire planet and destroyed all life in our planet. Yeah, and people say, kind, you know, kind what? of Andromeda strain ish. <laughs> that won't work because for one thing 
there's some people that believe, mm -hmm. well, I think it's a fact that the earth is bombarded by quote, alien proteins and amino, amino acids. There are some amino acids constantly. and meteorites. It's true. There's some right. amino acids and meteorites. Okay. So Fair. that's, we're getting bombarded by that stuff all the time and it's not destroying life on our planet. Mm. Some people will say, actually, not only that, we're being bombarded by alien life. But what happens is planet Earth is not it is inhospitable or planet Let's Earth has that. as life on planet Earth has learned how to deal with that in the same way that our body deals with viruses yeah. and whatever. It's got its own defenses mm -hmm. and it is able to protect itself from that because it's evolved mm -hmm. to or absorb that DNA yeah. into it. So you could say, like some people will say at some point, we'll realize that our DNA is full of alien DNA because we're being bombarded by it from the rest mm -hmm. of the galaxy for eons. And that's mm -hmm. just basically how life interacts with other life mm -hmm. in our galaxy. Mm -hmm. so so let, me, let, me give you, let me give you an analogy. So when we think about, so think about the Linnaean system of classification, you know, right? Like, you, you, you know, kingdom, phylum, you, you've heard, you remember this from like grade school, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're Archimedes or, uh, yeah, it's much older than that. But I was thinking Linnaeus had a very systematic. Okay. But yeah, there were, there were older ones, of course, too. Okay. So, but you know, folks on Linnaeus. Yeah, no, exactly. There's much older versions for sure. Okay. So Linnaeus uh, clarified his version of it starting in 1735. Okay. If if you were to look at something like a dog, right? So mm -hmm. it's it's a it's an animal. It's obviously not a plant. It's not a fungus. <laughs> okay. It's a vertebrate. It's got a backbone. Okay. Right. It it's um I'm trying to think what are other pieces to it. Animal vertebrate. Um, um it's it's got bilateral symmetry it's a, it's a mammal well yeah, no, that, yeah. That, but that would come back for it so it's a okay. mammal so it's 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 hairy gives milk to its offspring and it's okay. canine you can see by its appearance right okay so you have a fairly system got teeth good good classification there fox yeah. would a fox would fulfill all those categories too mm -hmm. if you have a cat it would be the first three but not the fourth right mm -hmm. it'd be it's still animal still vertebrate still mammal but yeah it's clearly not a canine if you get a seagull it's just an animal just a vertebrate not it's not a mammal it's not hairy doesn't give milk to its offspring got feathers got feathers yeah so it's yeah. A, you know a fruit fly it's just the first one it's just an animal it's not a vertebrate there's no backbone or anything like that so we have this hierarchical level of relationship to everything that we have around us, okay right and it's very clearly hierarchical and this is this has been documented you know you know way back like hundreds of years ago okay that reflects common ancestry and I'll show you, I'll, I'll give you an indication. I'll give you some evidence for why, just like one bit of it. There's tons of it. But I'll give you one bit of evidence for it, okay. not even touching the fossil record or anything like that. Okay. So analogies wise, generally speaking, people look more similar. So like dogs look more like foxes and they do like cats and everything. That's mm -hmm. true, but also true like it, on, a, on a human level, just among families. Let's say, for example, I would probably look on, I don't have any siblings, but I probably would look on average more like my siblings than I do my first cousins. Okay. On average. Right. I would probably look more like my first cousins than I do my second cousin on average, because in each case, I share less ancestry with them. I share less mm -hmm. you know, common DNA or something like that. That's true with, you know, dog, fox, cat, seagull, fly. For the same reason, it's true just within a family, even though it's a much smaller time. Frame. Mm -hmm. What I find really striking is if you look at the DNA sequence, which obviously DNA sequences were not around back mm -hmm. in like, when Linnaeus did this, okay. absolutely recapitulates this absolutely recapitulates it like dog and fox are like you know if you pick a particular random gene they're they're likely to be if not identical very very close to identical cat just a little bit further out and this is even not not even uh, picking you know genes that are actually associated with a particular trait it could be just some random just hunk of dna that maybe it doesn't have any particular function at all you would recapitulate this in every single case it's just kind mm. of amazing that you do that that again is consistent with this idea of common ancestry, and you see the same thing yeah. within families. Like I, I would be genetically much more similar to my brother <laughs> than to my cousin, et cetera. And you can take that right. further out. But didn't you tell me that that breaks down after like six generations? No, no, no that's a different thing. So the, the sixth generation thing is after, if you go back more than six generations, you it's possible you may not share, you may not have any DNA from a particular ancestor. Okay. That's what okay. that is. Yeah. So like, so for example, like I, I obviously got some DNA from some of those ancestors, but mm -hmm. after you go back more than six generations, like you're going to have more and more ancestors. Some of them are going to start dropping off. Like you actually are direct descendant, but none of their DNA got for a couple of them. None of their DNA got, got to you. As you go back to like 10 generations, like half of them, none of their DNA got to you, but you're looking also at like thousands of people. Okay. <laughs> so, 
All right, I'm going to ask you a totally, this is slightly off the subject. Oh, by the way, <laughs> I, I wore this short just for you. I, I was looking, I was reading it earlier. That's awesome. So what does it say? <laughs> Intelligence is the ability to adapt to change. <laughs> it's amazing that our brain can do that. Right? It is. You know? It's very impressive. <laughs> yeah. I love this shirt. Yeah. Um, so this is one thing about evolution that's always bugged me. Sure. Like, I, I get the basic idea, but when you start drilling into it, you start realizing, wait a minute. So there's some things wrong here mm-hmm. or some really difficult things that don't make sense. And here's mm-hmm. the thing that really gets me. How in the world can evolution produce a bird that can fly? Like, how did they go? Why is that a problem? (laughs) I'm trying to understand why that's a problem. Okay, here's the problem. It's like, um, you have this We we have a very good fossil record showing where they came from. That's why I'm wondering what the problem is. (laughs) So they came from dinosaurs, right? Yeah, yeah. They basically are dinosaurs. Doesn't it take several generations to go from a feathered dinosaur Mm -hmm. that's walking around Mm -hmm. on the ground and then for some reason its arms are no longer arms Uh, wings but then to go from that which is basically a useless form i see to suddenly a form that can fly that's very useful but how do you get there Gotcha, gotcha. So you're talking about the, inter- the intermediate state problem, yeah. So yeah. we actually see this uh, one way of looking at it. Look at like at what. So I don't know. I don't know the, the specific answer in terms of birds in particular, but let's use similar things. Okay. Um, well, I'm using bird. The reason why I use that is because flight. Is yeah, and also, like I'm, I'm going to stick with flight. I'm going to use. Yeah. I'm going to stick with flight. I'm just going to okay. set aside bird specific because I don't know that much about okay. exactly their history. Um, my guess. Now I'm, I'm just speculating a possible scenario. Okay. Imagine rather than like I get it, like you're looking at a you're looking at a very refined state. You know, birds are very very well suited to fly. And you think when you're thinking, you know, the ancestral dinosaur, you're probably thinking something that looks like a Komodo dragon. You're like, okay, <laughs> they're, they're like a million miles apart. I get that. Right. <laughs> okay, but let's let's take some other things. Think about like a, a flying squirrel. Okay. Right. They don't they don't flap. I mean, they, they're, they're called flying squirrels, but it's almost a misnomer, right? Basically, right. all it's got is just this big old flap, and it can kind of glide with it. Right. That the genetic difference between that and something which doesn't have that is not that great. Like, right. But that, that see, that a flying squirrel's different though, because all they did, I mean, I could see how in one generation you could have a weird squirrel that suddenly yeah. had skin between all its arms. Exactly. And then it's like, exactly. oh, you know what? This helps me jump out of trees. Exactly. So, so that could but have that's been way one of the, different than being able it to is. fly like a bird. It is, but it is, but if you yeah. imagine it as a as a step. Right. Let's say that that happens. Now let's let's iterate for let's iterate well, in the future. So are you saying that flying squirrels evolved into bats? No, I mean they didn't. But in theory, a future descendant of a flying squirrel might be more like a bat. Okay. I'm not saying flying squirrels evolved. Like, no, those are they're not related to each other. But I would counter that <laughs> because you know what? In order for a bird to fly, for one thing, they have to have feathers. They have to have a really good heart. They have to have. They have to have a really good um, strength to weight ratio. They got to have hollow mm-hmm. bones. There's a lot of stuff a lot that stuff. has to be right for them to be well, able to fly. <laughs> I'll, I'll, argue, I'll argue with you on that. Okay. I think you're, when you're saying has to, you're saying this is what's optimal. Okay. The other things, like you could imagine being having a really crap version of this <laughs> could be better than not having anything at all. And well, then as you have, when you get the crap version, then you just get like less Well, the thing is, version. is though, I mean, to be able to fly, either you fly or you don't. So, so let's say you're a crow, mm-hmm. but you're too heavy. So you can flap your wings all day, but there's no way you're ever going to get off the ground. Well, this goes How back is to that flying... crow going to su- survive? This goes back to my flying squirrel analogy. I'm okay. imagining that like this ancestor thing could climb up and climb up a tree or something like that, mm-hmm. and it could glide, right? So okay. it got to that. And then basically from that gliding point, it then iteratively got things, but like some of its descendants then got something which which may say the hollow bones. And like, oh, it actually now glides further. And then some other, dis, you know, some descendant of that one. This is the problem is that when we think of it, we tend to think of it as like a one step thing. Right. But it's really hard to conceive of the, the length of time it takes for these things to happen. Like we think I get that. as humans, we think about like, you know, if I tell you like this happened a thousand years ago, like, oh my mm-hmm. God, that's forever ago. If I tell you it happened like 10,000 years ago, you're like, oh, that's so long ago. But like, we don't conceive of that. Like that. that's 10 times the difference. Even if I say yeah. a billion years ago, you still think that's a long time ago. Okay, but here we go then. Yeah. So. I can, but it's the whole hundred monkey thing. Like if, if it's just random 
I guess ah, the, I love the, the idea, monkey in the animal. So I, the, I know the monkey, you're talking about the monkey doing Shakespeare. I know right. This. Like yeah, I can give if you, a you wait long enough, you'll get Shakespeare out of a bunch yeah. of random monkeys type. Yeah. Okay. But, but that's not the, the right. That's not the way natural selection. Natural works. selection is supposedly the mechanism that yeah. that weeds it out. It separates the wheat from the chaff. Exactly. If you want to, no, if the you problem want to go is the New Testament. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the monkey example is, is, this is appropriate though, because what happens there is you're assuming you're going straight from monkey to Shakespeare. But what's happening is some monkey, like you know, <laughs> types the letter T a lot, and T uh, typing the letter T a lot is a little bit better than not typing these other things. I'm, yeah. I'm just making. Let's, let's say it's going to get to the word the a descendant of that one gets the T gene and it types TH, TH, TH. And it's like, okay, one of those then ends up, that version ends up spreading. So it, it's right. iterative. It's not like a, this one monkey typed, you know. Uh, right. I, 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 I so actually it. what would have to happen is the monkeys would have to evolve <laughs> to an advanced enough life form that would even care about writing Shakespeare. And then they could uh, do it, right? After a, I mean, 15 billion yeah. generation i mean that that's one possible outcome but it could also <laughs> just be something where the, they just i mean so when we look at a fly coming back to the fly example flies okay. are not conscious of what they're doing at all <laughs> they're, they're not thinking about it like it, if well, it's well, well, just a second yeah. just because they do things over and over again in an unintelligent way doesn't mm -hmm. actually prove that they're not conscious like there's fair lots enough. of human fair, beings fair point. that's true they're supposedly yeah. conscious but they still do the same stupid things over and over again <laughs> right that's true that's true their brains are tiny though oh my god they have like i forget how many neurons it is i've, I've heard the number before they have so few neurons <laughs> they're so basic <laughs> yeah but i mean they're... probably was happening so we know for I mean, actually there's a there's a moth i'm trying to remember the specifics okay. on this there's a moth that when a bat is coming at it it like it 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 will try to evade the bat. Then when the bat gets really close, it like plummets, right? So people say like, oh, it knew the bat was coming and it does this. But basically, what happened is there's there's this pair of neurons in there, and if this neuron fires that many times, which is is triggered by the, the bat's you know ah, scream thing, his ultrasonic scream. Right. What ends up happening is its leg goes up and hits its wing, and it makes it fall down. But yeah. you could easily see that just being a simple product right. natural selection with no awareness whatsoever of what it's doing. It's just right. those is, moths that did that survived. <laughs> which is exactly, okay, I'm not a huge expert on machine learning, but from what yeah. I understand, that's exactly what machine learning is. Exactly. exactly. You just have a bunch of random stuff happening, but then a pattern develops yeah. and then something directs it saying this pattern is good. So let's reinforce exactly. that pattern. Exactly. exactly. And then and eventually you have a thing that can, then eventually you have a car, a Tesla car that can drive itself. <laughs> yeah. Okay? But even though the car is really not aware. It's true. Like the car doesn't give a shit whether it drives well yeah. or bad yeah, or yeah. not. It, what, the people who care are the, the humans that use the car. Yeah. But the yeah. car doesn't even know what it's doing. Car doesn't care. Yeah. No, no. That's it's right. just a bunch of patterns. Yeah. 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 You know, which is that's oh, actually, I'm curious. this thing. You're, so you're watching this season of Discovery. What do you think of Zora then along these lines? Um, let's see. So I'm on season. Let's see. I'm in episode five, I think. Of season four. I'm in season four, episode five, I think. I'm not all the way up to date on all the episodes. I think Zora, I think Zora's already come about where Zora is like having thoughts and feelings and stuff, right? I think that's already happened. Super right? cute computer. Yeah. What um, do you think of that? Do you, do you, I'm it's just a good curious. idea. Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> Zora has been around for a while, and it's interesting how the writers kind of just ignored Zora for quite a while. Oh, from the short it. trek, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, in my opinion, Zora is, isn't much different than Hal. We could talk about Hal from 2001 true, Space Odyssey, true, right? It's true. So, well, part of what made Hal work is that the person who created Hal imprinted his own psychology into him to make him work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think the same thing happened in the Star Trek episode with uh, what was the doctor's name who created the M5? Oh, yeah, the um, Daystrom. Yeah, same thing. Yeah. Where they had to somehow just don't some humanity yeah. into the machine to get it to work yeah zora and seems then, like she got hers on her own except some of it has to do with the sphere of data apparently i guess i'm not sure well again <laughs> i mean I, I always just keep i'm like a broken record i keep going back to it well for the artificial intelligence to actually be intelligent it has mm -hmm. to have awareness and then i keep saying awareness is not a result of complexity yeah awareness is something that is um, it's like a force of nature. It's like gravity. Mm -hmm. It's just something that exists mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in and of itself. In fact, I even go farther and say before the universe existed, there was awareness. 
And the whole mm -hmm. reason why there is, the whole reason why we're able to perceive the universe is because of awareness. Interesting. I like if this. No, if there was no awareness, the universe wouldn't even matter because there would be nothing to perceive it. That's so, true. That's true. In a sense, you'd say it didn't even exist. If there's nothing perceiving it, then it doesn't exist. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Sounds so, like, it sounds a lot like the tree falls in the forest question. Like, yeah, you're like yeah. <laughs> it's exactly that question. Yeah. And um, so, um, well, then, okay, so let's go to quantum mechanics for a second. You know sure. the double slit experiment, right? I don't know what that is. What is that? Oh, the double slit experiment? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I might you know, know. I just don't know that you know, name. But... It's the one where you have a slit and you yeah. fire an electron through it. If you fire a beam of electrons through this slit, you see an interference pattern on the back wall mm -hmm. of peaks and troughs mm -hmm. that just show how all the electrons are interfering with each other and create this pattern. Okay. Instead of seeing just a flat distribution, you see lines, kind of like spectral lines, okay. caused by the waves canceling each other out sometimes and, and amplifying each other other times, right? Yeah, yeah. So people are like, well, okay, great, light's a wave, okay? Or electrons are a wave. Mm -hmm. So, but we know that electrons are particles because whoever it was proved that it was someone in the 19th century with the oil drop experiment proved that there's a unit of charge called an electron and it's an, a discrete unit it has a certain value and everybody agrees that electrons are particles now. Okay. So somehow this huge amalgamation of electrons behave as, like a wave, like a stream of water, mm -hmm. but so all we got to do is dial back the stream until all we're doing is shooting one electron through that slit. And then from then on, it won't be behave as a wave. It'll just behave like a particle. And mm -hmm. you'll, if you shoot one electron through the slit mm -hmm. and then keep track of the pattern, mm -hmm. you'll just have a, just a, a complete, looks like a shotgun went through and you'll just see a bunch of dots on the other side and it'll there'll be no interference pattern at all that's what everybody mm -hmm. expected mm -hmm. well what do you know they did the experiment didn't work it guessing. didn't it still had the interference pattern and that really upset a lot of people for a long <laughs> time <laughs> and like that, that's the hard evidence that's made people have to admit that dang it it acts like a particle and a wave at the same time. Mm. And then that's like the key experiment that kind of gave rise to quantum theory and all this I stuff, see. right? Interesting. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. The thing that's really weird is then what's his face? I think it was Schrodinger. Everybody calls him Schrodinger, but I'm pretty sure you're really supposed to pronounce it Schrodinger in German because of the two little dots. Yeah. Not. That <laughs> talked about how he did another experiment similar that said, well, it'll act a certain way. Um, if you observe it, it'll do a certain thing. But if you don't observe it, it'll do a different thing. That's, you know, this thing in quantum mechanics where they talked about if there's an observer, then it, in yeah, effect, it affects it. Yeah, the, I remember that. It. And I thought, well, that's really weird. I mean, that's great that they think that way, but that's so weird. Like you can, you can, what is it? You, like you can determine... What is it? Uh, you can determine position or direction, but not both or something like that. That's right? the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. But the thing is, is I did a little research. There are some hard experiments that they did that had an observer in the experiment and one without, and it clearly had a completely different result that you can't argue. And, so, mm -hmm. and that's a thing that made everybody say, darn it, it doesn't make any sense at all, but that's what's going on. So there's a lot of different schools of thought that start talking about, okay, who is this observer? Is this consciousness or what is this? Mm -hmm. And um, so that it forced them to address the issue in some way. Mm -hmm. I see where you're That's going what's this. really cool. And, and that yeah. gave rise to the book, the dancing wheelie masters. Mm -hmm. And the, there's another book out there. Darn it. I, forgot yeah, what it was I, should, I should read some of these. This is really yeah. cool. So it's all super that's why I'm saying like the people that are into physics and people that are into quantum mechanics, mm -hmm. they realize, well, well, for one thing, there's a whole bunch of really weird stuff that goes on in the quantum mm -hmm. levels. Even now, a hundred years later, after quantum theory came about, mm -hmm. there's a ton of stuff that nobody can explain. 
And I guess for a while they thought string theory was going to somehow explain it, but it's string theory has kind of lost its charm now. Yeah, that's hard. Yeah, because apparently it it um came up with a lot of theories that kind of explain this stuff, but a lot of it's not experimentally proven. So everybody's well, well, it's a great theory, and it'll probably work with computer simulation, but nobody's proved that it's actually how things work. <laughs> yeah, Anyways. Fair enough. Right different on. topics yeah so, that's cool um yeah so just a heads um, up, i'm gonna have to go soon just a heads up oh yeah okay just tell me when uh so it's we've been going for about an hour or so mm-hmm. all right so like i said i mean we can go on and on and on it's like, oh yeah this is fascinating rails. topics yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, fascinating so topics. let's pull it back so let's make sure we hit stuff that you'd like to make sure we say before we run out of time so like if anything that you want to plug about your book or, oh, um, um, I mean, if Star people Trek, are interested, so you're doing also you're like a a, a group of podcasters, right? Oh, um, so I, so I have I have my own show, which is the one that you mentioned. But it's on my YouTube channel, Biotrekkie Explains. I have mm-hmm. essentially sort of two shows on that one. There's just my regular one, which actually I just released a video today. Okay, I don't know, I'm sure when this is airing, but today relative to me, not necessarily relative to the. Okay, listener. well, it, air, <laughs> it could air as soon as tomorrow. <laughs> oh, okay, so very soon. Yeah. Um, so those are those are very short videos on one scientific concept. So my most recent one is on genetic heritability, basically like how do you estimate how much of a traits variation is associated with genetics versus environment. Okay. And those tend to be all like, again, five or 10 minute videos. I also on the same channel have another series called Biotrekkie with the Admiral. And that's with uh, Jane Brooke, who plays Admiral Katrina Cornwell. Right. So those in those, we go over episodes of uh, season three. Those are already online of Star Trek Discovery. And we're going to release uh, in a couple of months, we're going to release the ones for season four, going through it, the science oh. and some of the production aspects for Star Trek Discovery. She wasn't in season three or four, but she comments just uh. from her experience as, you know, somebody in Hollywood who was associated with the show. And I talk about a lot okay. of the science that's observed there too. So, so she was my- the admiral that was like the the lover of um, oh, Lorca, right? Yes, that's correct. <laughs> that's not the first thing I would point out about her, but yes. <laughs> okay. Well, then again, they- Fair enough. <laughs> and uh, but you mentioned, I mean, you mentioned yeah, the yeah. podcast thing. So I, 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 I'm regularly on uh, things associated with the seventh rule or virtual Trek con. Those are not right, my that's podcasts. That's the one. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Seventh exactly. rule. Those are not mine, but I, I do a lot with them. I think both. Po- so the seventh rule goes through uh, episodes of Deep Space Nine every week and, t- and talking about that, as well as some of the current series, too. So, like the t- right now, they're talking about Star Trek Prodigy episodes, too. Mm-hmm. Wonderful group of people. The hosts are Ryan T. Husk and Sirach Lofton, right. who played uh, Jake Sisko on this. Go- on, um, right. And Space they were Nine. both at uh, Star Trek Las Vegas. They were both at Star Trek. Were Las you there Vegas. also? I was. I was. I gave a couple of so talks there, too. I was there, too. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, are you going to are you going again this summer? I've already signed up. Oh my, you know, <laughs> if you go if you go on the website, you can already see my name there. <laughs> I, I applied to get a booth in the vendor room for this. Oh, fantastic! Channel. So I, they oh, haven't that's confirmed great. it yet, but I'm like I'm I'm really want to do it. So. Yeah, I shared a I shared a booth. Well, I, I wasn't exactly sharing, but I was kind of hijacking <laughs> Melissa Longo. She's um she was the widow of Aaron Eisenberg who played uh, uh-huh. um, Nog on it. I kind of hijacked a little bit of her booth and was selling copies of my book there. I might do that again right. next year. <laughs> Basically, uh, you sure. can put your book on my booth. I'll, put it, <laughs> I'll give kind. you a corner. <laughs> yeah. You're very kind. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, I'm looking forward to it already. Yeah. But yeah, so Virtual TrekCon has a lot of the same people. So like, okay. so Melissa, Melissa Longo, who I mentioned, is also on the 7th Rule very regularly. She's also on Virtual TrekCon, as is Ryan T. Husk, sometimes Sirach Lofton, too. Mm-hmm. So and they have, a t- they have a show every Tuesday night called The Main Viewer. So it's just yeah. about some current Star Trek news. Like last night's episode also had uh, Allison Pitt from Daily Star Trek News and Dr. Cool. Anne Marie Siegel, who's an MD, and also a big Trekkie, too. <laughs> Great. Well, yeah. Sirach Lofton, he probably won't remember this, but I went to his table. And I started talking about the visitor, but I couldn't remember the name of the episode. Oh yeah! <laughs> but I was recalling it. I was telling how much I loved it. And I started bawling right in front of it. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, because I because when I saw it when I was when I was a young adult, so moving. I was so, so I was literally bawling through the whole yeah. thing. I started to tear up even oh. just within the first two minutes because I know where it's going. Like oh my yeah. gosh, <laughs> it's so good. So Do you see yeah. the, you see the panel about that on the Hollywood Food Coalition thing from Trek Geeks over the weekend. They had a panel about the visit. They had Tony oh, Todd really? who played, oh, I missed who played it. the old Darn version. It. Oh, it's still online. You can pull it up. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> They're the writer too. The writer was talking about how the the song, the, the what's that song? The Silver Spoon song. Uh-huh. Yeah. He said he talked about how that song influenced him to write the episode and stuff. <laughs> That's such a great episode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It just really it hit that 
nerve and me definitely well, a lot of people apparently of course the yeah. other super good episode is is um far beyond the stars yes yes and definitely. you know what Very um, moving in a different way do you know who mark zickery is have you heard of him yeah yeah totally he told me that he was responsible for creating the the outline for that story that's right that's you know true that? yeah that's true i didn't know that yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's actually i've interviewed him on my show oh fantastic yeah yeah, I'm in good company. <laughs> and I also, I also got to go out to lunch with him down in San Diego, at ah. San Diego Comic Con. That's what this is. Ah, nice. And because nice. um, I'm a, I'm a supporter of uh, Space Command. Was he? I'm trying to remember. Was he the one? I think when we had a seventh yeah. rule of pro, uh, associate producers meeting at Star Trek Las Vegas, I think he came and just kind of joined us and just like sat down at lunch with us too. So it was oh, cool. okay, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know yeah. he was there. Interesting. He's such, I think just, it was him. I'm, I'm, he's, he's such a high energy guy, man. Yeah. yeah. Really inspirational. Okay. Yeah. So sorry. I got you a lot of off track again. So All good. Um, seven. I already tool. hit my stuff. Okay. Okay. So we got seven. Virtual tool, Trek Con. Virtual Trek Con. Mm -hmm. And then the university. And then um, your YouTube channel. Yep. And then and then uh, then you teach at Duke. I do. Right. And then do you do any other kind of tutoring or stuff like that on the side or? I have a I have a class online in Coursera. If anybody's interested, so it's a free online class anybody can take. It's just on genetics and evolution. It's basically it's basically the same course that the Star Trek book was based on, but without okay. the Star Trek. <laughs> wow, that's very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, like I said, I mean, we're basically just constrained by your schedule. Yeah. Like yeah, I can keep going that. for another hour if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I could if I had all the time. I would definitely do it. Okay. Well, maybe we'll do another one later because it's, it's. I mean, we. Yeah. You know, we. I feel like we just scratched the surface of a bunch of stuff. Totally. You know. <laughs> but it's great. I just love having these kind of conversations. So. Thanks so much for having me. It was, it was very, very okay. thought provoking for sure. Very good. Okay, so let's just sign off. We'll do our live long and prosper. Whoops. Okay, <laughs> I that. okay there we go wait oh that's a very strong one i like there it. we go live long and prosper my brother <laughs> my fellow um human being and dna Yay. whatever we, what we, we share 99.5 percent of our dna <laughs> oh, my dna brother all right take care Fantastic creations emerging spontaneously from the space of life. For the benefit of all beings everywhere. We gotta 